I'm Alad Edwards, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Structural Genomics Consortium. Everyone is keen that there be a vaccine. Um, and we're all hopeful. And I don't think we've ever seen such a mobilization of intelligence towards making a single product. But we also have to be realistic. We've been trying to make an HIV vaccine since the mid 80s with no success. We've been trying to make a hepatitis C vaccine with no success. The data for coronaviruses in animals and in people show that it is not a virus that induces strong immunity. Um, and while some of the current vaccines in trials are looking pretty good, I think the proper response is to plan for no vaccine and to make contingency plans expecting that there will not be a vaccine. Even if there is one, it won't come for a few years. So we're going to live in a two-year hiatus of no vaccine land. But honestly, if it were me, I'd plan for no vaccine. And then if one happens to come, all the better. And even if one comes, not everyone can take a vaccine. Vaccines don't work in everybody. It's hard to distribute vaccines. We are going to need alternative approaches, even if there is a vaccine. And like I say, um, that's not a certainty. If we assume that there will be no vaccine, we have to have contingency plans. So if you look for other viruses, what's kept other viruses under control is antiviral drugs. So HIV has gone from a disease that kills people to a chronic disease. We also have to worry about accessibility because it's not enough that the drugs exist. Everyone on the planet has to have fair access to them. So that's one contingency plan. How do you make antiviral drugs and ensure that the world has access? Everyone in the world has access. The second contingency plan is to make sure we test. We are flying blind. We don't know where the disease is. We don't know the spectrum of clinical phenotypes. We really need to know who has the disease, how long you're shedding the virus, if you get immune once you've had it once, can you get reinfected? We can't make public policy positions without any of those data. And so we need to, as they say, test, test, test. And then finally, we're gonna to need to have interesting ways to socially track who talked to whom, right? Because if we do find out there's a breakout, we're gonna to need to contain it as quickly as possible. And again, that's gonna be data driven. Um, I would like to remind Canadians though, that we have it easy. This will kill hundreds of thousands in the developing world. And we are an affluent country. We have to think about that now. It's not only about us. This is gonna be tragic for developing nations and we have to focus on that. Genomics is the concept of lo looking not only at a single gene, but looking at all the genes in all the organisms. And so when you talk about the genetic sequence of a virus, it's the sequence of that one virus. If you talk about the genomics of COVID is how the virus evolves, why the Washington virus is a little bit different than the Ontario virus and how they came to be like that. That's what the concept of genomics is. So the use of genomics in, in combating as it were, or even learning more about COVID has been quite remarkable. And it, this is an instance where it's not uh, all hands on deck, let's invent something. But we've, over the last 20 years, through consistent investment in genomic science, created the infrastructure that could be turned and was turned on a dime uh, to tackle the COVID problem. And so it's super important for people to realize that our, in quotation marks, rapid response to COVID was only because we've been heavily investing in these technologies for decades. Bioinformatics is a super interesting field. It actually is the science of studying the data of biology. One of the most significant contributions so far is the ability to trace the evolution of these viruses, to know who caught it from whom, 
in how is the virus evolving. That involves looking at a sequence of letters, hundreds of thousands of bases, hundreds of thousands of letters, and looking for one or two differences and how those one or two differences change. And that's obviously takes a lot of computer power, but once again, it uses the technologies that we've developed over 20 or 30 years of studying genomics, and that could was turned on a dime to study the COVID. The world collaborating to try and tackle the COVID problem at many levels uh, has many facets of collaboration. One is between scientists, and honestly, scientists, particularly at universities, don't really know any national borders. We always collaborate internationally. The challenges come between countries, and, and you've seen an unfortunate sense of nationalism occurring across the world. That's a little barrier to collaborate. And the other interesting barrier that is temporarily down is between the public and private sectors, where the concept of uh, COVID is such a disaster, as it were, to the economy, that financial gain, as it were, is being slightly set aside to tackle this common problem. Um, and so what's really interesting is the willingness of the public and private sector to work with one another to, to tackle this problem. My consortium is funded half by industry and half by governments and foundation, and, and daily I deal with at least 10 large pharmaceutical companies. And I can tell with absolute certainty that every scientist in every one of those companies is desperate to try to help. And the senior management of those companies is desperate to try and make a difference. And this, I mean, I'm not naive. This isn't going to continue past COVID where it's a competitive world. But right now, it is really um, nice to see that these industry scientists who are, you know, parents and members of society like all of us are doing everything they can to try and help. Open science is a uh, interesting term because it means obviously many things to many people. At the most fundamental and 30-year-old definition is once you've accomplished your science experiment, you share the data with people. The more extreme version of open science is to share your experiments as you're doing them. And then the ultimate manifestation of open science is to not even think about putting any restriction on use, including patenting. And what we're seeing in the world in this last five years is different people taking different approaches. We happen to take the latter approach. We're of the most extreme, as it were, version of open science. But with COVID, what we're seeing is that those organizations and governments that looked at open science, our version, with a little bit of, mm, maybe that's not right, have thrown all the worries out when COVID came. And it's, of course we should be sharing. Of course we could be, because it's a crisis. So it's interesting because I'll, you know, I'm remembering one year from now, I'll go back to these very same folks and say, you don't think the, the parents with a child who's dying of cancer, you don't think they think that's a crisis too? Why don't we share there? Why only when it's a big virus? Why not for Alzheimer's? You know, the mom... The, the, the family that's looking after a, an elderly parent with dementia, it's a crisis for them, right? And so I think this is going to be potentially, in my fantasy world, a rethink of the values of society and how we should be dealing with how we invent medicines and, you know, the balance between medicines as a human right and a product. Maybe the pendulum will swing. I, I live and dream. to open science are uh, obviously institutional and incentives because when COVID came, they all went away, right? And so obviously they're a construct of how we organize science and how we think about medicine. So society has left the discovery of medicines in a, in a tactical move to industry because it is expensive. And as a consequence, industry is doing exactly as it should in that context of the economy it's trying to make a profit. And sometimes then that profit leads to uh, high prices because they need to recoup their investment. And society says, well, I don't want high prices. Well, you can't have it both. If you want to create a sector of the economy that you say make money, you can't at the one hand stop it and say, okay, you can't make money. And so I think that what we need to do, and the barriers, sorry, but the barriers in academia are different. You know, in academia, 
we're um, get promoted on prestige, right? And prestige often comes with keeping secrets. So you're the, in quotation marks, first to discover. And if you want to be the first to discover, some people think that they need to keep secrets so that no one else finds out. Universities are incentivized to patent, right? Not, you know, our basic function is to create knowledge for mankind, but there's this insidious little part of the university system where we're, the governments fund us and tell us that we should protect our ideas. And so now you have a, a sort of conflict inside the university where at the one hand, we're told to create knowledge, and the other hand, we say to keep knowledge secret. And both evidently are in the public good. And so when you ask what are the barriers to open science, there are these series of economic constructs, societal constructs, societal incentives, institutional incentives, all that sort of conspire against sharing, right? But at the end of the day, we don't have drugs for Alzheimer's and in large part because of this whole construct. So I think it needs a rethink and maybe the COVID crisis is the catalyst for change. We've set up a nonprofit called Vimy in order to coordinate, uh, together with all the players around the world, uh, an effort to make antiviral drugs to put on the shelf in anticipation of the next pandemic. You can ask why no one's done this before, and it's a good question, and it's largely because there's no commercial incentive to make a medicine for a virus that may never exist. Who would invest in that? Right. And so it needs to be done under a different business model. And we believe this nonprofit model, which has been used for malaria and other diseases, is the right one. And we're just setting up that that we're just setting up that project now uh, and it'll work with industry, but it'll practice our version of extreme open science. We won't file for patents. We'll create the medicines as a public good to put on the shelf and break glass in case of next pandemic to take it out and get it and get it into use. I think the lessons for our policymakers are to take a more proactive approach to prevention. I think we in Canada we have a distributed system of science funding where uh, it's slightly balkanized. There's no, in quotation marks, czar of pandemic preparedness. The different branches of our governments uh, sometimes don't communicate. Um, and it, and it's, uh, it's no one's fault. It's just a function of setting up the system that way. Um, you can see that the Americans uh, have similar problems, but they have such a bigger budget that it doesn't matter that each of their individual silos can make a big impact. Canada, we don't have that luxury. I think we need to be more clever. We did it with uh, PHAC. They've done a phenomenal job. And I think on the science side or tactical side of the, of the country, we can probably do a, a better job of organizing the smart people we have and driving it to some conclusion. Uh, we don't tend to do top-down things in Canada. We tend to um, shy away from that. I think in instances specifically like this, it probably is a mistake. The neat thing to me about COVID and many of the other viruses that have emerged and is the fact that the close proximity of mammals, um, it, monkeys and people or chimpanzees and people from whence came HIV, uh, the uh, Ebola virus, this virus, it comes from the intermingling and it sort of says to the commonality of life, as it were. Um, and we got to be prepared for it in the future because as people and animal juxtapose, these viruses will hop from one to another. And the other interesting thing, as far as I can tell, is that it's actually not the virus that's killing people. It's something about the human response. And I think science is going to get at that. You know, it's very clear in animals, like there's one strain of, there's a kind of coronavirus that infects mice. And if you give it to one strain of mice, they all live. And another strain of mice, almost genetically the same, they all die. And so there's something not about the virus, it's exactly the same, but something about the DNA of the person 
that says live or die. And we'll be able to figure that out. We've never had enough people infected to divide them into two groups, live, die. But now if we get the DNA sequence of everyone who lived and the DNA sequence of everyone who had to go into intensive care, there will be clues. And from those clues, we'll be able to figure out. And that will be true for influenza. And that'll be true for coronavirus, any virus that causes this respiratory distress syndrome. And I'm kind of hopeful about that. What I think will be, and hopefully the positives that come out of this, it's the the first time I think that our global economy, our health infrastructure has been stress tested. And it's revealing a number of inadequacies in our system. It's revealing the inadequacies of how we care for our elderly. It's revealing the inadequacies of the global supply chain model. It's revealing the inadequacies of concentrating key parts of our economy in small places. Like if we have only three places that make all the beef for Canada and they all shut down. And I think Potentially, it's going to mean that we will pay more for stuff. Uh, But at the same time, that'll mitigate these, uh, as it were, unfortunate consequences of how the world has evolved. Um, And I think that will be for the better. I also hope that for the better is that we think about the future more. I, I, you know, as much as this uh, virology disaster is affecting society, it's nothing compared with what the climate change is going to do. And our young people are depending on us. And if we can do this for COVID, why can't we do it for climate, right? And, and more, than, more than us depends on us fixing the climate thing. And so, again, I'm hopeful that uh, the lessons learned, you know, extend beyond health and, and into other factors or other facets, sorry, of society. I'm Alan Edwards, and this is my future economy.